get to it. So um, Karsten's going to take the future trends part of it. I'm going to talk about how users are struggling to adopt the technology, the collaborative technology, and the kind of numbers that we're seeing and how to overcome that. Um, changing behavior, organizational behavior. We're just going to talk about the CEOs are sometimes the trickiest people to overcome in terms of using those, the, the collaborative technologies. Um, then we're going to be talking about the transformation, going from a PC culture into a BYOD culture. Um, and then hopefully you, you, you do adopt the baby of BYOD because it's coming. Um, uh, Lance did a good job of introducing us, so I won't do that. Um, and that's me. Um, let's just set the user perspective right now. Um, first off, 50% uh, 50 50 of, um, of the workforce is expected to be mobile by 2015. So, or two, yes, yeah, so it's coming. Um, it's sliced by industry sector. Some industries will adopt it a lot quicker than others. 41% um, of um, our 41 are 41% are using their business applications on their BYOD devices. And this is a really interesting one. And um, there's a lot of customers coming to me uh, saying that we need to get on to BYOD ASAP because they're actually um, workers of all generations, not just young ones. Are, are trading in cash for mobility and flexibility. So it's a good um, employee retention and attraction tool as well. Um, this is a debatable, uh, I was talking to somebody on Graham's team the other day. Um, yeah, and um, he thinks the number is 90% of IT organizations are having problems. Everybody can't cope with the BYOD, but Gardner says 100%. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Karsten. Well, good afternoon. I'm terribly sorry to be between you and a drink. In England, that's just about one of the worst places you can be. And uh, I'm also afraid I'm not going to give you a lot of practical advice because that's not what academics are good at. I'm going to do what I'm best at, namely telling you something you didn't know you needed to know about. So, so an academic is a good example. If you, if you mix one of me with a mafia boss, you get somebody who will give you an offer you don't understand. <laughs> so hopefully, so hopefully I, can, I can try and alleviate that a little bit. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, two issues that relate very much, and they relate directly to each other and to the issue of bring your own devices. The first one is about why is this different from any other technological innovation? in organization. It's all about intimacy, but I'm not going to show pictures, so don't get too excited. The second thing is that this is all about a big scheme, the big scheme of how to make uh, the industrial world more productive. And given the, the recent uh, numbers from, from, the, from the US numbers that just came out this morning of a, of a, of a slump of 0.1%, we need that. So I'm going to try and link, bring your own devices, the unique aspects of that, to what, what companies may need in the future, indeed most of you will need now. So the point is, of course, what, what we really, really have failed to understand is this uh, relationship between technology and the human beings, and the kind of technology we all now take for granted is just the start of it. So what's unique about them is, in the sense, if you take the mobile phone as an example, is they forge an intimate connection between the human being and technology. And if we look at the speed by which people are willing to adopt the technology and the fact that there are more mobile phones in developing countries than there are internet connections across the world makes you obviously think immediately that this is technology that is different from other technologies. The, the mere fact that people in developing countries who cannot afford a phone, they will still buy one. It's like the bumblebee effect. It doesn't know it can't fly, but it, that's why it, not, it does so. Otherwise, if it knew it couldn't fly, it would fall, fall down. So the business models in India, telecom, is about how small an increment you can charge people for. And, and the point there is it, it serves a very deep need, clearly. Uh, and, and the best example is given by Jan Chipchase, who used to work for, uh, for Nokia. He argued that the mobile phone has got the same place in our, in our, in our hearts and on our, in our minds and on our body as, as keys and credit cards. So keys, they represent the ability to get roof over your head, the credit card represents money that represents sustenance if you need to eat or drink, which you will do in a moment when we're done, and, uh, and the mobile phone represents the connectivity to others so they can help you if you're in trouble. And if you look at this, so, uh, so the way we look at these modern technologies that they are much more than the traditional mobile phone of just being able to call somebody. They become uh, like a pair of shoes. This is a, a TV series from America back in the, I think, 70s. Uh, the shoe detective here. They become like a pair of shoes that mold themselves to our needs. 
as we can put apps on and we can do stuff with them. And in the same way, we then, of course, our feet gets molded to the shoes, but uh, that's, for, that's for another discussion. And what's happened over the last uh, couple of decades is that we get increasingly advanced uh, and tailorable technologies that allow us to connect to global infrastructures of various kinds. They can be uh, company infrastructures, they can be telecommunications infrastructures, or of course, since 2007, most commonly the internet. That we can, we, can, uh, we can attach ourselves to these infrastructures, but yet, so we get the, the global scale at the same time as we get highly individualized use of these. And if we look at the killer app for the PC was spreadsheets. So spreadsheets allowed individuals to make sense of complex information in organizations. The mobile technology we talk about here, it allows individuals to make sense of much more than just company information, about connectivity, social networks, lots and lots and lots of other things. And the, the, the interesting thing about it is that it is democratized. So this is Steve Mann. He's a professor in uh, geekology at, uh, at uh, um, he used to be in MIT, now he's in, uh, now he's in Canada somewhere, I forgot, Toronto. And since 1978, he's had a, 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 team, a small TV screen, a video camera, and a, and a server or, or PC stuck to himself. Around 2000, he decided to dress himself as a suicide bomber, which is something in London I would, I would discourage. <laughs> and, uh, and as you can see, technology has moved on, so it sort of disappears. And he's made a long career out of really trying to live as a cyborg. And the point is, we are all cyborgs. If you have a smartphone, you're a cyborg. You have exactly the same as he has. So he's become democratized. So we all have this ability, which is, in a sense, very, very, very interesting. Because, uh, because one of the things that happens is it's not only that the technology is portable, we can take it with us, it's also that we can start using the fact that the, that the technology knows where it is, or we can let it know where it is. So all these services like Foursquare, where you check in, and all this idea that you can map yourself to a place in the world is extremely important. And this idea of ubiquitous computing is exactly one, it's not just you can bring it with you, but it in, in, intact meaning, in meaningful ways with wherever you are. And this is just a very simple uh, way of trying to understand so what makes the mobile and ubiquitous technology different from other kinds of technologies. Well, it is that it is intimate. We carry it with us and it knows things about us. It is pervasive that it can know about where we are, uh, uh, whether there's a lot of traffic where we are, whether it's very noisy, all sorts of things. It, it, it is portable, so we carry it with us. It is uh, connected to various kinds of infrastructures. It can remember things we have done before, so it can help us remind us of various things we might need to. If you have Siri, you can say to Siri, remind me tomorrow when I leave home to buy, to bring milk or whatever, and it'll do so. And then it can help us prioritize our, all our barriers of interaction. And this is something of a business idea because there's very little done on this. Try to help people deal with all the information as a result. And the point here is, if we look at the architecture, is in a sense, in a very simple sense. So we have all these smart devices, and we have all these very advanced services that are residing in what is called the cloud. And then we have very fast connectivity between the two. As as, as far as the user is concerned, it happens on the device. But as far as the service provider is concerned, really all that matters is the service, and we'll get to that in a minute. And I'm not going to go into great detail all the possible technological advancements we can discuss, but you can take each of the current buzzwords of new technological development and you can, you can map that against well, what does it mean for an intimate relationship between a person and their technology. And, and that then gives us new opportunities to do new and interesting things. And, and what we generally see is that we see this intermingling with very advanced technologies in everyday life. And, and we have not even begun to see the consequences of that yet because we have really, since 2007, only had internet on the mobile phone. And all the services that are developed for these kind of, these kind of smartphones and other devices are still very much in their infancy. <clears throat> but the one thing we have uh, reaped is the benefit of what you can call very cheap connectivity. So this is from 1986. This is Honeywell's, before it became Honeywell Bull. Uh, the, the image of what is electronic mail, and I, I'll defy anybody who will, who will say that this is not a very good picture of what, uh, what email is these days. So this idea, we have this very, very cheap connectivity, uh, and what are we then going to use it for? That's the, that's the question. And one of the things we use it for is what's called mobile working. So you can have doctors walking around in the, uh, in the, in the, in the wards, so they can visit patients who can't move themselves, 
Or you can have remote work, workers sitting around the globe uh, and having, having office-based team working with people on the other side of the globe. But the more interesting thing is if you combine those two, so you have what's called mobile workers that both work locally walking around, but also are remote from their colleagues. And we get this fluidity of where you work. And that makes up very interesting opportunities that we need to work out how to use. So, so, the, so the, the kind of discussion we, um, Dave and I would like to have with you is really how to think about, uh, instead of only looking at the practical arrangements of who's going to buy the gadget you have in your pocket and who's going to service it and all those things, that's very interesting, but we want to also raise the issue of how do you transform the organization to actually make good use of this. That's much more important. And, and to take this debate, I need to go back a couple of hundred years. If I had an hour, you could have the story from the 19th century. We have to fast forward, so we'll start at the 20th century. So what was the whole 20th century was about? Like you, We are all born in that century, so this is our century, the century of the 20th century. It was all about product uh, transitions. It was all about making mass consumption uh, uh, possible through various kind of processes that enable us all to buy uh, new gadgets and uh, buy washing machines and cars and bicycles and all of those things. So it was all about uh, products, mostly products, some of these services, but mostly products that were delivered through simple encounters. That you would, you would go stand next to a factory in Birmingham and then somebody would throw over the wall some product that they manufactured and you would take it away and use it. The 21st century is by all means shaping out to be very different, as you all will be aware of if you read the, any kind of press on these matters, namely the, the, what's called the service society. And what's characteristic about the service society is very much that people expect to get high quality services for very, uh, for, at very low cost. And high quality services, you know, like a butler, deliver high quality service because the butler will know you and the butler will adapt to whatever your mood is. So if you're in a terrible mood, he won't talk too much. If you're in a very good mood, he might strike up a conversation. That's a good butler. And he will through, follow you through life and grow with you and help you in all sorts of ways. And the point is, this is really the challenge for most organizations to deliver high quality services and relationships and support and fun at very low cost. A really a big challenge because that's what very few of your organizations are, 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 are shaped to do that. But that would be the next uh, 50 years, if you work that long, that would be your challenge. To make your organization able to really do things in an interesting manner. And that's, uh, you know, in a sense, a very different talk from ours, but I want to link to it because the point of the, whereas the point of the 20th century was these mass produced encounters that only were possible because of standardization. We, in, we engaged in a huge project where we tried to make individualized quality services for next to nothing possible, and we have to standardize to do that. We have to do it through technology. We have to make, we have to make cold technology able to deliver warm relationships, and that's almost impossible. But it is not impossible entirely. And that is the, the huge challenge to how to automate fun and games and warm relationships and support. So the new deal we have is that the, the, that the 20th century is all about trying to help uh, the blue-collar workers become more productive. They are as productive as they can be. We cannot squeeze more productivity out of it. The supply chains and the tunnels that transport around the world are Various kinds of technology are completely empty most of the time, except for really what is being sold. They are all just in time. So the next project is the bottleneck is all the innovation and knowledge workers. How to scientifically manage their, uh, their output and their process so that they can deliver this constant innovation of inex inexpensive engaged relationships. And that's a massive challenge, but that's what we engage in doing. And in doing so, the wrong way to think about it is that all this bring your own uh, devices, uh, this idea of, uh, of, of having mobile, intimate technologies, is all about you working from home or sitting at the beach. Bar humbug. It is not. The more you can uh, talk to anybody at any point in time, anywhere in the globe, the more important it becomes where you choose to be. I have chosen this afternoon to be with you. You might live to regret that. I might too. Who knows? It depends on what happens in the bar afterwards. But we have chosen to be here. It matters for us to be here. We could have sat at home. I could have listened to this online. I could have done lots of things. But once you choose to be somewhere, it matters. And for most organizations, the biggest challenge is to work out where should their people be. It's important where you are. You can be anywhere, so you should be somewhere that matters. Before, you had to sit by your office because that happened to be where the filing cabinet was. Now you can choose where do you want to be. 
not at home every day. Come on. You've got to go and do some work. So the point is really to link these things up. And in doing so, uh, this is what happens already. So this is just a slide that says something about how work is changing already. How work is becoming flatter, more flex flexible, outsourced, crowdsourced, hyper-specialized, all sorts of buzzwords. And this, this covers a real phenomenon that work is being reshaped to fit this 21st century. We still haven't got a clue what we're doing. We just all agree on that. We still don't know anything. But we're trying and we're humans. Eventually we'll get it. It'll take 50 years, but then it'll be brilliant. And then we'll be ready for the next one. The point is, of course, that in this, if we distinguish, for example, between transformational work, which is what plumbers do, uh, transactional work, which is what call center workers do, and interactional work, which is what most of us do, the two first categories are very easy to put wherever it's cheapest. And the last one is not. So our work will be innovation and interaction work. And that means this is the kind of blue collar work of the 21st century. So, so the way to understand this is that any company in this world have to fight two survival games. There are two games you can play. And in the old days, you, you could do one of them and you'll be fine. But nowadays, it's a bit different. So you have uh, what's called an improvement survival uh, pattern, which is that you start, you start from the bottom and you say, okay, I'm a bank. Oh, no, the bank is such a bad example because they, they sort of uh, did a bad one on us all. But, but let's imagine you're a bank. And, and you think, well, the customers, we need to make sure the customers are happy. So we need to make sure that whenever they enter our branch, there's a nice person sitting at the branch, smiling at them and saying, what can I help you with? And then they present their little bank book and they want to take out money and they want to deposit some money. And we need to, be, we need to make sure we do that. We can't just suddenly abolish all branches so people don't have anywhere to go. They'll get angry. <clears throat> that means at the operation level, you have, to, you have to be able to meet that kind of need. And at the tactical level, that means you have to have a supportive organization. There constantly needs to be somebody manning the desk in the branch, otherwise we, our customers don't know who to speak to. At the strategic level, that means we have a strategy that's quite stable. If you go in the opposite dimension, it's an innovative, an innovative uh, um, uh, survival pattern. That's typically high-tech companies have been able to do that in the past. So you, if you are like a Cisco or an Apple or a Microsoft or an Amazon, uh, then you, you, you start with a, a very dynamic strategy that says, well, two years out in time, there will be this fantastic technological opportunity. We're going to run with it. No matter what, we don't care. We're going to run with it because otherwise we're going to go out of business. So that means the organization has to be very flexible. It has to be ready for suddenly change. So when, uh, so when uh, uh, Bill Gates, in his, uh, one of his books, he, he never mentioned the internet. Uh, one year later, somebody in, from BBC interviewed him and said, what, what is the name of your internet division? And Bill Gates said it's called Microsoft. Our internet division is called Microsoft. They've completely changed direction. So the point is you have to have a very flexible organization. And that means at the operational level, you have to have a network. Now the point is, as you all would know, you can't have both of these at the same time. It's simply not possible. Yet you have to. In the old days, you could choose one of those and you'll be fine. Nowadays, the pressures mean you have to do both at the same time. And this is what is called ambidexterity, that organizations can both walk and chew chewing them at the same time. Most organizations are inhabited by men, and men are not able to do this, so maybe that's one of the causes of the problem. But the point here is, the ability to somehow mix these two is really the paradox of, of trying to resolve that. And one of the ways of resolving that is through mobile technology. Because the point is, if you devolve the decisions like in my organization, I'm never told what to do. And that has sometimes uh, regrettable consequences. But nobody ever, ever tells me what to do. Because it's my own fault if I do something wrong. I'm the only one who's going to ever suffer the consequences, really. Because I won't get promoted or I'll get fired. So I'm completely driven by my own decisions. And what modern organizations increasingly will be, they will be driven at, uh, by individuals who at all levels will be required to make the decisions about looking up or looking down, looking five years ahead or looking at their feet. And you have to do both. As an organization, it's impossible to do that comprehensively unless you devolve it, at least some of it, to the individuals. And that will, of course, mean that these individuals will, have, will need the, the means to do so in the same way as in the 80s and 90s and the noughties, uh, companies allowed individuals to drag down data from central servers to manipulate them on spreadsheets so they could make sense of centralized decisions and try to influence them. So it's a way of empowering the individual to make better uh, resistance to the existing regime of decisions. This will be even more needed in the modern organization. 
for, for a startup, most people will not work for one organization. They work for many organizations. The, the world of the freelancer has already begun and it'll be even more so. So the point is these flex, uh, flexible arrangements need some stable anchoring points. And, and one of these sta stable anchoring points is exactly these advanced Rubik's cubes that have, we have in our pockets that means that we can configure whatever services we need for whatever purposes uh, we need to appropriate them to. And I think, yes, so just to hand it over to Dave, so in terms of bringing on devices from the company's point of view, it does not make sense for a company, for LSE to tell me what underwear I should wear. You know, I, you know, here's our company underwear. It would make no sense. In the same way, I would resent it deeply if they decided what intimate technology I should wear on my body, operate in under my skin or behind my ear or whatever. It's got nothing to do with them. Their job is to deliver services that I can, that I can access from any device and their remit is therefore to ensure that their provision of services to me are okay. I'm going to take care of my own technology. Dave? Um, so let's set the scene from a, from a user adoption perspective, and this is what's happening in every single company right now. Um, there's, people have an average of about five to seven collaborative technologies that they're using. Um, but with these collaborative technologies, there comes no instructor-led tr instructor training, no knowledge or tips of how to use it, no access to user guides, uh, constant upgrades, and sometimes inefficient help desks. There's a reason why employees are, are uh, the, the two big reasons why employees are going to BYOD, whether we like it or not, is one, the peer relationship, having that intimate relationship with their device, just like what Karsten was talking about, in terms of it being another pair of shoes. It's as intimate as that. And then the familiarity factor, and there's actually a direct correlation to productivity. If I'm really efficient with my device, um, I'm going to do more work. And why organizations are thinking of BYOD? First off, attractive work. Green IT. This is directly aligned to everybody's sustainability and green initiatives for an organization. Uh, BYOD helps reduce the amount of infrastructure in the organization. So it's aligned to that KPI for a lot of socially aware um, and practicing companies. Focus on strategy. The idea here is if I can give my give my employee a, uh, a device, not worry, worry about the access, worry about the security, and worry about the applications, I can focus on more strategic things, such as looking what the next big thing is two, two three years down the road and trying to keep up with Cisco in terms of innovation. So, Karsten and I were in, this were in his office at the LSC about three weeks ago trying to put this thing together. Um, and we were talking about this BYOD, BYOD, and I said, but Karsten, you're going all over the place. Make it relevant for what I do for a living. And we came up with this thing called CYOT, and it's consume your own technology. Um, and what I'm seeing in all these organizations is there's a complete lack of user adoption on, in, within collaborative, uh, for collaborative technologies. I'm seeing rates for telepresence rooms, 6% used in an eight hour day. I'm seeing rates for WebEx, which is 10% of corporate wide adoption of active users. And then you dig a little bit, scratch beneath the surface and you ask the organization what an active user is. And it's, sometimes it's based on using it once a month. So all of a sudden, that business case, and that justification that we use in order to go to our CFO or our CEO to buy this technology is not being realized because we haven't really hit, those, hit, the, hit the justification of everybody using it. That business case is based on the majority or everybody using it. Um, so CYOT really covers not only just the collaborative technologies, but also the services. Um, sometimes we will see in an organization, and this is across, you get a new toy. I remember Carson's, he said, everybody has an IT drawer. I can't believe I'm quoting you this <laughs> late in the day. Anyways, um, everybody has an IT drawer of used goods. Um, you use it once, you'll use it twice, and then it goes in there. And you never see it again. Um, we'll see a spike in using, but that's about it. So what stops the adoption of new technologies? First off, um, um, we, we talked about it this morning, but it's who, who, who likes to change? I mean. I, for three weeks I've been going, I got this offer to upgrade my uh, computer at work, and now Cisco is offering us supported 
IT supported um, Mac Chromebooks. And uh, I'm horrified. I let a user adoption practice, for God's sake. I'm completely horrified. It's that innate nature. I heard a statistic that 75% of all people in organizations have a complete resistance to change, and it's always from the top down. Everybody knows that. The second one is inadequate sponsorship. When I go into an organization, and I always start inevitably with the IT organization, and immediately I try to get out of the organi IT organization and say, give me your business verticals, give me your leaders. I want to see, I want to see, I want to, I want to look at your org charts for, for R&D. I want to look at for marketing. I want to look at for finance. And the kind of leaders that I'm looking for are not necessarily <coughs> at the top. They're those, sometimes there's those, there's those leaders that just need a project like this to really put themselves on the map. So it's innovative leaders and usually ambitious leaders, rather than the guy at the top of the food chain. Um, unrealistic expectations. Um, this is a big one. You know, uh, this says what it is. Project management. I, I'm going to go back to that dedicated project manager. Um, and, and every once in a while, I go into an organization, very, very rarely, and I have somebody who's assigned to user adoption. But this is not an L and D person. This is not a project manager. This is somebody who has balanced capabilities and competencies. Project management, give me Prince2 training, sure. But give me that change management training as well, because it's absolutely huge. You heard, you heard Didier talk about the Valley of Despair yesterday. Project managers have tough times justifying Valley of Despairs in spreadsheets and project plans sometimes. So a, a really qualified change manager, when the organization is saying this is crap, or, taking me away from my core, core business? Why am I spending two days to adopt this new technology? Um, you know, they'll be able to work with the organization to, uh, uh, through that. The other way, one is case for change. What's in it for me? I'm not seeing this in very many organizations. One of the most innovative organizations I've seen that's, uh, that's, that we're working with right now, um, uh, the head of it said, I want my campaign to be Enjoy the technology. Enjoy it. Not do it. Not an email from IT, but what's in it for me? Guess what? You can be more mobile. Guess what? We're going to give you these applications. I mean, um, you know, uh, employee, employee, the employee life cycle, I mean, it just ticks so many of those elements on the employee life cycle from attract, you know, recruit, attract, uh, retain, develop. I mean, all of them. So, the what's in it for me thing and really communicating um, to those employees, the messaging and the communications is absolutely crucial. Here are the top 10. ten. DJ showed it yesterday. Um, and we just dealt with the top five. So, uh, uh, you know, somebody who's, who has the competencies in change management, and project management, and in, in learning and development, I mean, all of these different factors are going to be able to target them what to do and use Cotters and whatever other methodology and NGCL to be able to address all of these. And addressing all of them is crucial because you will have all 10 of those in your organization. We talk about the Internet of Everything. And, you know, I mean, Internet of Everything is, is in, in ubiquitous computing are, are, are coming closer and closer. We just need to improve the technology that much more so it can be ubiquitous computing so we don't have to talk about user adoption. So true CYOT, consume your own technology examples. Um, one is the UK police. Karsten did a lot of research with this, and I'm going to talk about product development, and then uh, a friend of mine works in, uh, as a, at an NGO in Africa, so I wanted to discuss a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so it's just a very brief example. So uh, uh, we did a big study of, the, of, the, of mobile data, mobile technologies in the police force in, the, in a contemporary in the south of England. And a very interesting observation was that uh, they are extremely advanced in the use of mobile technology. Uh, but they decided that the, the police guy is the owner of the mobile phone, it's not the person. So all these officers have their own mobile phones, but then the police car have one. Then they decide also to change police officers between cars, which means that when officers, they want to call somebody, they always call from a private phone to another private phone. So the point is, you know, that it shows the strength of this technology, that they are willing to spend their own money using their own technology because the connections really matter to them. 
And even if the organization enables enormous amount of interaction through, a, for example, an in-car mobile phone, they still choose on occasions to use their own technology. And, and so I think a lot of the adoption behavior is about understanding how to change the work processes. And in the police, they are very clear on the use of mobile technology. Many other companies are not. Yeah. Uh, new product development. Um, I had a customer, a, a client, about a year and a half ago, and um, we were we were working in their new product development department. And we, 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 we you know, each each company's NPD process takes about no, it's eight six to eight steps from idea generation to uh, getting the customer feedback and then feeding that back into the product to improve it a little bit more. For this specific company, it took about six months from end to end. What we realized was every time we released that new product into the marketplace, there was an 11% spike in sales. Um, so what we wanted to do was cut that six months down into two months. But we have all sorts of you know, uh, dislocated people all over the country and in Wales and in Scotland and in England and in, in London and Manchester. And so getting those people physically present in order to go through idea generation and all the way to reviewing the, 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 the new product was just, it was killing us. So we equipped them with all of this technology that we've been talking about for the last couple days. And we set up the process, we set up the project plan, etc., etc. We brought that down to two months because of the people just embracing it. But we put a lot of training and support and change management, getting these people who have been in the industry for 30 years to adopt these new technologies and, and ad adopt these new platforms was, was quite the challenge. But that was the toughest part. Um, and we brought it down to two months, so that was quite a successful project because now we're seeing that 11% spike happen a lot more often in a year. And the NGO, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over because we're gonna go uh, grab me a drink if you wanna talk about it, but a friend of mine works for the Clinton Foundation and he's trying to break the bond between um, uh, mothers and children, the AIDS connection, and we were talking about this CYOT, BYOD, um, uh, issue a couple weeks ago, and it's, it's really interesting, so talk to me if you're interested about it. So, what do we do to realize the IT investments and consume your own technology? I mean, high-level project plan, um, and, and uh, we were looking at the NGCL yesterday. I mean, these things, you can click down very, very deeply into this. But um, this is what we work with at Cisco on customers at an exceptionally high level. I guess the key points that I want to say out of this project plan is it doesn't need to take a long time. Um, I'm seeing customers buy a suite of collaborative technologies and it taking two to three years to get an okay number of user adoption. But we can put focused programs together for you know eight to nine months if it's a smart program. So that's one of my key points. I guess the other key points out of this is going to be what DJ was talking about yesterday too, is that stakeholder engagement, which we talked about, and the type of stakeholders we really like to work with. Training, communications, and marketing. I mean, the training can be a number of different ways. Um, and the communications is absolutely crucial, the what's in it for me, getting the right stakeholders to, to, to launch that. Um, and measurement. Um, I was just told we have this tool called TARS. Has anybody heard of this? I'm learning about measure, measurement tools all the time in Cisco. But the point is measure, measure, measure. UPS um, has this slogan, and I work, I work by it. And it's in God we trust and everything else we measure. <laughs> That's the first thing that we do when we start a project. So, CYOT, consume your own technology and bring your own device. Business imperatives. Um, every single thing that we do and you do needs to be linked to those business imperatives and justifications of, of buying that technology in the first place. Um, and we can link user adoption of BYOD and CYOT to innovation, like I was talking about, uh, you know, reducing that length of innovation time. Um, time to market, cost control, getting things off the shelves quickly, and also, nobody likes to buy uh, collaborative technology and it sit on the shelves and not being used. 
Talent acquisition and retention, we spoke about, and there's KPIs for all of these. I mean, this is what we're, this is what we need to measure at the beginning of every single project. Innovation, the time to market, whatever the business imperatives are for the business. And, and business growth. Um, the example with this is uh, a customer came and said, there's a lot of different uh, customers are emerging markets, emerging markets. We need to go to emerging markets. And the case study is, this guy was in Shanghai, and um, it took him too much time to drive to the provinces outside of Shanghai. So what we did was we launched a focused program in order to not only get him ramped up with all the technology that allows him to be collaborative remotely, but also his key customers around the provinces. So rather than doing a road trip once a month, He's talking to them every single day now. So for emerging market stuff, this is so relevant. And sales effectiveness. So in closing, BYD, it's here. Consumer own technology, we're far away from doing that properly. Um, if we do it right, um, and if we give the dedicated resources and the right competencies, it's absolutely huge. Um, and if we provide the project management, training, marketing, business process support, um, it'll make our lives and our business uh, investment a lot more justifiable. Thanks, guys. And one more thing I want to say is um, Felipe did all these animations. Good job. Yeah. So I just want to thank you and thank you.